Super. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for a really exciting presentation. My name is Chanel Hasten. I am the Director of Outreach and Community Relations for the Alaka Alliance. And today we have three researchers from interdisciplinary fields of geography, photography, and design that will advocate for the prosperity of the Pacific Coast kelp forests. Kyle, Patrick, and Emma will discuss the role of perspective in creating stories that spotlight the kelp forest's return to ecosystem balance, especially with the reintroduction of sea otters. So to start off, I just have a quick little opening um, to talk about the Alaka Alliance and who we are. So sea otters were once very plentiful along the entire west coast from Mexico all the way up to Alaska, but there's currently an 800 mile gap right now from Northern California to Northern Washington where sea otters are no longer present. Um, but for at least 10,000 years, sea otters were an important part of the culture um, of the people along Oregon's coastline. There is a very strong cultural heritage connection to Oregon coastal tribes. And as you can see here, there is at least six different words for sea otter and how the Alaka Alliance came to be. The late David Hatch, a Siletz tribal member of the Coos, Sayusla, and Aleut descent was searching for an indigenous indigenous name for his sailing dinghy that he and his son Peter were, build, were building and found the word alaka in a Chinook jargon dictionary which meant sea otter. And so this chance uh, this chance find led him down a path of activism to raise awareness to everyday Oregonians and scientists alike about the extirpation of sea otters from Oregon, their key ecological role and the possibility of their return. So our mission is to restore a healthy population of sea otters here on the Oregon coast and in the process help make Oregon's marine ecosystem more robust and resilient. We are extremely lucky to have such a wonderful board of directors formed by tribal nonprofit and conservation leaders, as you can see here. We're also very grateful to have the support from partner organizations, including Oregon Wild, the Collins Foundation, Defenders of Wildlife, Seattle Aquarium, Oregon Wildlife Foundation, Oregon Zoo, the Surfrider Foundation, Meyer Memorial Trust, US Fish and Wildlife Service, and many more, which can be found on our website. So we are currently in the process of putting together the final touches on a complex feasibility study and economic impact assessment covering all the things involved, the pros and cons of um, a possible sea otter reintroduction here. And we will publish those findings next month actually on our website, so be on the lookout. Uh, this will allow for public comment and review. And hopefully if a consensus is reached, we will move forward with restoration in several carefully chosen locations here on the Oregon coastline. You can stay up to date with everything that we're doing uh, by joining our email newsletter, The Raft, which just came out today. Um, and you can check us out on all the fancy social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. So this evening we have Kyle Cavanaugh. He's an assistant professor of ge geography at UCLA who helped lead the project Floating Forest that uses NASA satellite imagery and UAV technology to map the density and dispersal of kelp forests worldwide. We also have Patrick Webster, some you may know as Underwater Pat. He is an underwater photographer based in Monterey, California, capturing imagery of the Central Coast kelp forests and their inhabitants. Emma Ekmekshin, sorry, I think I got that right, um, is a graduate student and artist at the Design Media Arts Department at UCLA, working to communicate the importance of kelp forests in human and non-human cultures. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to them. And just a reminder to, if you have any questions, use the Q&A feature or the chat box, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much, Chanel, for the introduction. It's an honor to be here at this Alaka Alliance webinar with Kyle and Patrick Webster, uh, friends and collaborators. As you mentioned, we are from three interdisciplinary research fields, 
um, which include geography, photography, art and design. And we found that our interests met um, with this shared interest in visualizing change in the kelp forests, how it's adapting or not adapting to warming ocean temperatures, loss of predatory species, with climate change and human impact alike. We're here gathered together today because we're currently working to develop a project uh, and in collaboration uh, with Alaka Alliance to visualize the kelp for this forest a little bit further up north than our usual home here in Southern California. So we hope to travel up to Oregon and learn more about Alaka Alliance's plans to reintroduce otters to the coast. And we hope that through art and science, we can visualize what the hopeful restoration of the kelp forest might look like, um, how it transforms through time and how key species are so important to its success. Um, and so our kind of thinking right now and our goal in doing this um, would be using photography, photogrammetry, aerial photography, 3D modeling to tell stories about the kelp forest, to invite you to care about the kelp forests and learn ways in which we're connected to it. So for some of you, kelp might not have that certain kind of charisma um, that the heartwarming sea otter has. Um, however, uh, Pat, Kyle, and I feel that kelp has is just as awe-inspiring because it is a home and a foundation for all the creatures of this marine ecosystem that we've all come to love. So for you today, we have uh, three short presentations to share about our individual practi practices and the convergence between science scientific methods and art. So the first to share will be Kyle Kavanaugh, um, who's a professor of geography at UCLA, uh, a friend of mine who was actually my professor a few quarters back. And uh, yes, take it away, Kyle. Awesome, thank you. Can uh, you all see my screen? Great, cool. Well, thank you, Chanel and Emma. And a big thanks to the Laka Alliance for the invitation to come here and talk about, talk about our work. So over the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to just briefly talk about some of my research that uses satellite imagery to tell stories about trends and variability in kelp abundance along the west coast of North America. Um, another big thing that I want to do is introduce Kelp Watch, which is this web-based application for sharing and visualizing the data with the public. And, and with Kelp Watch, you can go check out how your favorite kelp forest has, has changed over the last 35 years or so. So it's you know nice to get a historical context on some of the Put some of the recent changes that we've been seeing in, in a historical context. Now, the Kelp Watch tool and the, and the research behind it has been very much a collaborative effort, and I want to acknowledge the rest of the team, particularly the Nature Conservancy, who funded the project and provided the development, you know, web development support. So, you know, my current research, I'm really interested in trying to understand patterns and drivers of variability in kelp abundance over large scales. And with a focus on giant kelp and, and bull kelp, right, the big canopy forming species in this region. And I'm currently working to try to characterize long term trends in kelp abundance and identify areas that are seeing increases or decreases over the past few decades. I'm also kind of focusing in on the impacts of this marine heat wave between 2014 2016 and how that how that influenced um, canopy forming kelp along the region. In general, my, you know, I'm a, in the geography department, my research tools involve remote sensing. So using satellite aerial imagery, um, giant kelp and bull kelp both form these, these floating canopies that are relatively easy to detect from, from above, from satellite and airborne imagery. So I'm working to create standardized data sets, take multiple sensors, multiple types of imagery to, to stitch together kind of a long-term story and, and you know, relatively long term, I guess, 30 or 40 years. So we can we can start to perform retrospective surveys, identify, you know, decadal trends, um, like I mentioned earlier, put some of the recent changes we've seen in a broader historical context. A lot of my work uses Landsat, which is the satellite program run by NASA and the USGS. The Landsat program is, is a series of satellites that provide continuous model monitoring dating back to the early early 1980s, in some cases even earlier. Um, the data is totally freely available to the public. It's a fantastic resource. And we've developed methods to take this imagery and create maps of kelp canopy from it. The imagery is 30 meter resolution. And 
we've developed a, a, a method to create seasonal maps of kelp abundance along this entire coastline from Washington to the southern range limit of giant kelp in Baja, California. And you know, with this data set, we can, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of the methodology. I'm happy to, to discuss that for those afterwards, for those interested, but um, just just present the data. With this, you can, you can look at dynamics on bed scales, on regional scales, um, and, and so on. Um, there are some limitations with, with Landsat that I want to highlight. It's 30 meter resolution. So each pixel is 30 meters by 30 meters. So it, it sometimes will miss small sparse canopy. It's not great for detecting you know, very near shore fringing forests. Um, it only detects canopy floating on the water surface. So we're not getting subsurface kelp. We're not getting understory species. And we've you know, ourselves and, and collaborators have, have validated it for using for use on both giant kelp and bull kelp, but we can't differentiate species. So in areas of mixed beds, we can't tell what part is giant kelp and what part is, is bull kelp. And KelpWatch is this tool that we've developed to, to share this data. I'll give you the link in a moment so you can explore it. Um, the, I just want to show you some uses. You can click on the methodology tab here and, and get more details about the methods, how we turn imagery into maps. And then this, this map interface allows you to explore kelp in different, different regions. Um, so we'll, I'll zoom in here to, to Southern Oregon, um, Port Orford area. When you get close enough, you can see that this interface changes a bit. You see this, these gray shapes. That's basically potential kelp habitat. It's anywhere we've observed kelp over this 35 year time series. So we're assuming this is potential habitat that could, could be colonized by kelp. Then if you look along the bottom here, you'll see a time bar. Um, right now it says Q3 of 1984. So um, Q3 is the, is the um, summer of, of, of 1984. And if you look back up onto the map, you can see these blues and greens. That's giving you the canopy area at that point in time. So the summer of 1984, this is what kelp canopy looked like around Port Orford. Again, that gray area is potential habitat that's unoccupied. Um, and so with, with this tool, you can, you can basically animate through changes in kelp canopy dating back to the, to the early 80s. In some cases, like you see this, this white area. So that is um, a no observation. So typically due to cloud cover, it's a little bit more common earlier in the time series. Um, but for most seasons, we do have an observation. You can start to see visualize changes in, in, in kelp canopy um, on local to regional scales. You can see kelp canopy is highly variable. There's this seasonal cycle in this region, interannual variability, decadal variability. Um, and so this is a nice tool to visualize it. You can also download the underlying data behind this for your area of interest. So you can use this geometry tool. Here we'll highlight, you know, or for reef. And now the, the bottom timeline, you see these bars. This is showing the amount of kelp canopy area through time in, um, for this, this area of interest that, that we've highlighted. You can see some, some seasons with, with pretty high kelp area in the early, you know, throughout the 1980s. And then you know, in the last 10, 15 years, on average, kelp canopy has been a little bit lower and, and, and more stable. Um, so this is a, a tool that you can visualize. You can actually download this data to a CSV if you wanted to go take it and perform your own, own analyses. Um, I'll just finish by, by zooming to a site a little bit south here. This is Rogue Reef, um, just because the dynamics here are a, a, a bit different. Um, here we've actually, actually have seen a, a resurgence in, in kelp, at least over the last five years between 2015 and 2000. And, 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 and 20. Um, so here's the, here's the link. Go check out your, your favorite, favorite kelp forest. I'll, I will say that, that the data I just showed you is a beta version. Right now, we've just presenting currently, you know, at live is, is only data from California. Very shortly, within the next month or so, we'll expand this, ext extend this to that broader area that I mentioned, Baja, up through. Um, Washington and then and, and and Alaska. So bear with us, but but shortly we'll have we'll have Oregon and, and some of these other northern regions up up on the site. Um, I also would recommend. I, I I know Sarah Hamilton has has given a few talks at um, related to symposia or other meetings with the Alaka Alliance. So many of you will be familiar with her work, but 
This 2020 ecology paper is, again, it, it really describes the methodology behind extending this, this method to bull kelp. Um, we originally developed it for use for giant kelp. Um, and so she took it, helped us expand it to bull kelp. And she has a, you know, some of those patterns I was showing at Orpha Reef and, and Rogue Reef, this paper goes into a lot more detail about, about those patterns, the drivers of those patterns. Um, so, well, you know, I gave you a little taste with kelp watch. Sarah's work is, is, is you know, a really nice view of, of, of drivers of dynamics and, and some of the interesting um, impacts or lack of impacts of that 2014, 2016 heat wave. So um, go check that paper out. Just stepping back, I'll, I'll close by showing some regional time series of, of you know, I've split this, this area into, into six regions ranging from Baja up to Washington, um, the Olympic, Olympic Peninsula. And I think that, you know, the, the, the thing that's striking to me whenever I look at kelp dynamics is how variable it is. Um, extremely variable on annual, interannual, um, decadal time scales. It's, it's kelp abundance is, I think there's a, a high natural variability, which makes it difficult to detect kind of long-term trends, right? It's, it's difficult to detect in, in most of these regions, we don't see any clear long-term decadal linear trends, perhaps with the exception of, of, of Oregon actually, where we do see some, like I mentioned earlier, some years in the eighties with really high kelp abundance. And since, since 2001 or so, we haven't seen any of those kind of boom years. It's it, on average kelp has been a little bit lower, um, a little bit less variable. We didn't see, you know, a, the huge negative impacts of that 14, this 2014 to this 16 heat wave here, as we did in Northern California. Um, again, a lot of variability in Northern California, no linear trend, but um, kind of more concerning is, is this dramatic collapse that I think a lot of people were familiar following the heat wave, the loss of sea stars, the sea star wasting disease, this explosion of urchins in Northern California. Um, has led to some, some pretty unprecedented, at least over the last three or four decades, um, very low levels of, of, of kelp biomass. Um, on a regional scale, Central California, again, you don't see a clear, clear trend. Um, you don't really see the, the, the collapse following that 2014, 2016 heat wave. Here, if you zoom into Central California area, especially around the Monterey Peninsula, you'll see a lot of small scale variability. There's, there's areas in, in Southern Monterey Peninsula where kelp is at you know, historically low levels, very close to areas where you know, kelp is at normal or even above average levels. So um, a lot of, lot of small scale variability in Central California. And then Southern California and Baja appear to be relatively resilient um, to, that, to that heat wave, which I think is surprising given the fact that these are sort of in the Southern range of, of, of giant kelp. Um, you might expect them to be more sensitive to temperature variability. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll pass it off to, to Pat. Again, encourage you to check out Kelp Watch. Um, take a look at, at, at the kelp forests of your backyard. Send feedback to, 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 to me. Um, and thanks again. Right on. Thank you, Kyle. Let me just share my screen here. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in um let's go okay classic zoom everybody can see my screen feeling good all right great stuff uh well first of all thank you so much uh to the alaka alliance and to uh to emma for organizing this kyle thank you for the, the intro uh chanel thank you for as well um setting everything up for us uh, my name is patrick webster i'm a um, underwater photographer out here in the monterey bay and uh, this is my pithy little title about photosynthesis and just kind of figuring out at some point that I became uh, an artist that was documenting an ecosystem in flux as opposed to a spunky young marine biologist out there with a camera. Um, and that transition happened sometime um, in the last 10 years that I've been out scuba diving here in the Monterey Bay area and, uh, and in other spots. So these are just some thoughts on kelp because uh, I spend a lot of time photographing kelp and uh, that's me real quick in case you need to get in contact with me. I'm underwater Pat on social media channels and also underwater Pat at uh, gmail.com. If you need to send me an email, tell me how uh, much you disliked or appreciated this presentation. That's how you can get a hold of me there. Uh, and that's me diving in a bull kelp forest that is growing off of the Carmel Pinnacles 
here, uh, which are actually just off of Pebble Beach here. Um, just about uh, three weeks ago, um, we've had a lot of really, really great kelp this year that I've been going out and taking photos of. Um, and I would say, you know, we talk a lot about sea otters uh, and I'm actually, some of you may know, affiliated with the Monterey Bay Aquarium. I help do the social media uh, over there. Um, but right now I'm talking as mild mannered Pat Webster, underwater Pat on my own time. And uh, I love the sea otters, don't get me wrong, but I mostly love all of the other things that the sea otters are around and helping, uh, helping be around. And that's kelp. I spend a lot of time in kelp forests. Uh, giant kelp forest, this one here off of Carmel. Uh, bull kelp forests here off of Stillwater Cove or bull kelp generally take a lot of those photos. Um, and just for anybody out there who's an algae snob, somebody out there really wants to let everybody know that there's more than just the canopy forming kelps. Here's your slide. We've got different types of palm kelps, pteragophora um, or northern sea palm, laminaria, which you may see in the inner tidal now and again, uh, and eclonia, which was Isenia back in the day, which is um, this beautiful southern sea palm, as it's called, not the same as the sea palms you find in the intertidal. Um, but these are all taken here off of, off of the coast. We have this understory of algae underneath that massive canopy that the bull kelp and giant kelp are fighting over. So just want to shout out to these kelps that are out there too. Um, there's also miscellaneous ground kelps. This is Dictionurum, I believe. We've got some coralline algae, uh, some red algae with a nudibranch that's enjoying the ride there. So definitely love taking photos of all of the other algae out there, but truly I spend most of my time with giant kelp, Macrocystis pyrifera, and bull kelp, Neriocystis lutkiana. Um, this is, I mean, one of my favorite things to see. One of the great things about scuba diving in the Monterey Bay is that you learn to do your safety stop somewhere in the water column around 15 feet following the kelp up. And as a photographer nowadays, I get a mandatory three minute photo shooting session with the kelp on my way back to shore. Um, and so I've spent a lot of time taking photos of these absolutely incredible organisms, enemies of each other, it would appear constantly competing. Uh, for real estate there on the reef, but absolutely gorgeous. Um, and so, yeah, kelp photography is one of my favorite pastimes out here. There's just something about this blade here, the scimitar blade of giant kelp, where all of the kelp blades are pouring or they're peeling off of one solitary blade. And you can see right now that the floats are all arranged in a row. They'll eventually rotate around and have their buoy and their blade um, off of the, the stipe there in the middle. But to me, this is visual umami. It's just so satisfying to look at a scimitar blade. There's just something about it that really captures the eye. Um, and then bull kelp is just incredible as well to, to dive in a bull kelp forest. Um, this was taken a few weeks ago. This is more of the artsy side of the underwater photography. These bull kelps growing off of Monastery Beach at the edge of a giant kelp forest. Um, and uh, they had really nice silhouettes that I was able to uh, show off here. Um, so this is uh, my, my favorite place in the whole world is the Kelp Cathedral. Uh, I grew up as a missionary kid, but I think that my first religious experience happened in a kelp forest. I don't think I know that the first time I truly had this out of myself feeling of being part of something far, far bigger uh, was being in a kelp forest similar to this one found off of Carmel. And bull kelp forests are not something that I knew too much about until so many of our giant kelp forests were eaten away by the urchins. And behind them have been growing in different bull kelp forests. Uh, and so there's interesting dynamics going on between giant kelp, bull kelp, sea urchin, sea otters, oceanography all the time that kind of determine what type of kelp is around from Kyle's data, it changes. Um, our range here happens to have that overlap of giant kelp and bull kelp. So it's kind of interesting knowing that the aquarium was built with a bull kelp forest off the back deck, and then now it's a giant kelp forest that's out there. Uh, so from the 80s to now, things have changed. This reef here is off of Pacific Grove. It changed from giant kelp to an urchin barren to bull kelp back in 2019. Uh, or yeah, 19 is when I took this particular photo. And so here's that fun interplay of the two, uh, the two kelps, bull kelp and giant kelp fighting for light resources there. Um, this is off of Carmel, beautiful dive site. 
uh, that happens to have these big bull kelps and giant kelps all competing for the same light. And I, am, I didn't know this when I first started diving out here because you only have your blinders on to what you know for a little bit when you're learning is that this is not a scene frequently seen along the coast to have bull kelp and giant kelp in the same spot. So here in Monterey, we've been very fortunate to have this consistent giant kelp forest around, even if it's become spottier than, uh, than it used to be. So just some more pretty moments looking at the mermaid's hair of the bull kelp there, and then you know going out, taking these beautiful, or attempting to take beautiful photos of something that's far more beautiful than what I can truly get in my camera. I'm trying, getting closer every time, but not quite there yet. And of course, that was changed uh, in our area by those sea urchins. The, the story is famous now, you know, sea otters eat urchins, urchins eat kelp. So if there's sea otters around, then there's no, um, then there's fewer urchins and then there's more kelp. Turns out that a lot of that is, you know, true, but also simplistic to how it is that urchins behave. If you go back and look at the other Laka Alliance talk uh, with some Monterey Bay folks, uh, friends Kate and Josh um, there, take a look at their talk and they talk about this behavioral change that happened with a lot of the urchins in our area that they showed up big and hungry because certain things like maybe the sunflower sea star were no longer around. This is the last sunflower sea star that I saw. This is actually in 2018 that I saw this one. So when they were supposed to be completely gone, this one's about two and a half feet across. So it was a monster um, sunflower star. This one since have not seen that I've gone back to the same spot looking for it. They crawl around a lot, maybe it went deeper, not sure it went, where it went, but these are basically functionally extinct for our area. And from Josh's talk and Kate's talk, you'll see um, that the removal of these sea stars from sea, uh, sea star wasting disease may have been a huge contribution to these hungry urchins crawling out, feeling emboldened and going out there after the kelp during the bad kelp years um, that we had because of that heat wave um, that was mentioned. So here's a photo that I took uh, that really was the first photo that um, made me realize that I wasn't just out there taking photos for fun anymore. Um, certainly it is enjoyable to go take these photos, but there's a story, there's something happening. Um, my childish ideas of just going and having fun all the time, every dive now, it's like, oh, there's a story that's being told. There's something happening out here. So this photo, uh, ended up being in the New York Times story about the sea urchins uh, collapsing. And that was the first time that I was like, oh, I'm taking photos of things that I need to really be paying attention to. And so from that point on, there's been a lot of different things going on with urchins. This is my friend, Andrew Kim from Monterey Abalone Company and Moss Landing Marine Labs, collecting a bunch of urchins for aquaculture. You may know of the giant, giant kelp restoration project happening out here where they're smashing sea urchins to see uh, what we can do as people to mediate kelp returning to reefs. Um, and so this is a lot of the view that we've been having as, as divers in some of our favorite dive sites. But as Josh's talk mentioned, our kelp and our urchin barrens are very patchy here in the Monterey Bay. It's not at all the same thing as what you have on the North Coast. And so this photo was taken about 100 yards away from this photo. Um, in the same dive site. This is some palm kelp underneath that giant kelp there. And that's largely due to these little, little weasels that I know uh, very well from working as a volunteer with them for about uh, four and a half years at the aquarium. Um, this is the second photo of a sea otter that I was ever able to take underwater. This one, uh, there was a trail of bubbles going by me underwater. I thought maybe a cormorant was diving and I showed up and surprised our charismatic little um, kelp weasel doing its thing, going after some marine invertebrates. So these otters in our area have been gardeners of their little kelp patch. And so it's been pretty wild to see that you can have otters and kelp and then right next door an urchin barren. And if you watch the talks, because those urchins are in the barrens are not very tasty. The ones in the kelp areas are tasty. And so the otters are doing their thing. And uh, so along our coast here, we've also been able to see bull kelp just pop up kind of out of nowhere. There's a bunch of research out there, some research coming out suggesting that maybe kelp may be dormant in different areas. And then when conditions are good, can suddenly pop out everywhere. The idea that the, the kelp that you're looking at is actually a lot older than what, uh, than what you think looking at it. And so here are some photos from this year where we're having a good kelp year finally after many, many years of bad kelp. This is a leather star that does eat urchins hanging out in some very young giant kelp. Um, this is a young Aclonia sea palm that was growing up. 
very adorable, very cute. And here's some bull kelp that's growing off of the caramel pickles in a ring around the giant kelp that is up shallower. And these are growing from urchin barrens that were down about 70 feet. I got to see the, these areas get cleaned out and now there's bull kelp coming back uh, in those cleared zones. So there might be a little bit of succession going on, a little bit of the classic, uh, classic debate between giant kelp and bull kelp for real estate with a sea urchin inter intermission there. Um, interesting to think maybe the parallels between what we see in our kelp forest and what we see on land with our fire season where slow burning fires used to be common and then we had hot burning fires from fire suppression and then we have climate change now making all of that story and management and everything that we had going on for a few hundred years kind of go out the window. So maybe something similar there with the kelp. But kelp is not only, oh my goodness, I'm going over time. I'm so sorry, Emma. Um, but kelp is not only a beautiful thing to look at, it's also economically important, it's culturally important, it's, it's spiritually important, um, not only for divers, but for so many people that have been here along the coast for 10,000 plus years. And our modern industries rely on kelp. Part of the big reason you have the Monterey Bay Aquarium is you have kelp out here uh, along the coast. And uh, so not only is it beautiful, but it's also important for industry. And these are just some photos of some good friends over there at the Monterey Abalone Company um, that are living now in a world with sea otters, with changing kelp. You can see bull kelp, giant kelp, and then these abalone that are being aquacultured here, a sustainable method of collecting this kelp. They harvest it by hand, the first three feet, cut it off, make sure there's nothing else in there, put it into the abalone cages, and now we can have our abalone and have our sea otters too. And uh, that leads me to the first sea otter photo I ever took, which was one of those little suckers coming after me while I was diving at the abalone farm and uh, being very curious as to whether or not I had the key to the abalone cages. So just thinking a little bit more about um, how our area has changed so much and how uh, we have so much beautiful kelp here and a different story than in other places, but we have our otters around. And I can tell from a photographer standpoint, a scientist standpoint, that if it weren't for those otters, I wouldn't probably have this same background uh, on this, on this uh, webinar today. Okay, so with that, thank you. And over to you, Emma. Thank you, Pat. It's always a, such a fun experience to submerge myself in your underwater photos. And I'm always looking at them when I'm missing being underwater. And I would like to share a little bit with you about my experience with kelp. I am an artist, as Chanel had introduced. I'm a design and media arts student at UCLA currently. And I first came to know kelp by visiting the beach and smelling, most importantly, smelling and then seeing the kelp rack. And it was that kind of roaming kind of scent that really drew me in and then to look at these textures and diversity of different seaweed species that you can just find on the beach. And more specifically, a place that really drew me in and where my art practice really took this direction of looking at the kelp forest is at the beach and more specifically at Tecolote Beach on Santa Rosa Island. And you can see that there is quite a kelp rack on this beach. You have a lot of seagrass washed ashore, which is what you can see primarily from this photo, but with closer inspection, you can see all different types of seaweeds. And while I was doing this and looking at this beach, I was also helping out scientists. I was a volunteer for a group of researchers that were going out with CSU Channel Islands, which was my undergrad university. And uh, on the weekends, we would do these uh, three day long excursions, picking up as much trash as we can inside of designated transects. So this is Tecolote Beach, as I saw it in, in person. And then this is also Tecolote Beach. So what I've done is kind of looked at the data of all these transects, the quantity of trash that's collected, the types of trash, and tried to interpret them into different patterns that I would later then use um, to do my weavings, to do large um, interpretations of seaweeds. And so, here we have three transects on Tecolote Beach as it's known through the data in these really large CSV files. And so trying to chew on that data and interpret it from an artistic lens is something that gets me really interested and excited. On the beach 
in uh, alongside the kelp racks, we also have these enormous bundles of net and rope that wash ashore, um, different types of plastic. Um, we've probably seen such a variety of things that you could probably name something and I could say yes, um, it all washes ashore. And so just that amalgamation of thinking of the seaweeds, thinking of the plastics and thinking of the ocean, all of this fishing gear washing ashore, um, it made me start thinking about what's happening under the water. And I was really intrigued to start looking at the kelp forests and all these different connections that human culture has with the kelp forest. Here we are hiking up the trash, um, as sometimes we collect from 100 pounds. And in one weekend, we even collected over a ton, so over a 1,000 pounds of trash. And a lot of it is uh, fishing debris. Uh, and so it's quite a trip to take it from a desolate island and then back to the mainland. But these early experiences and excursions really shaped the kind of art that I make and really drew me into the kelp forest. So naturally, I was inclined to take some of this debris because the question then after you return to the mainland is what are you going to do with all this, this waste, you know, how do you recycle it? Net is very difficult and rope is very difficult to recycle. It breaks down very easily. It can be really frail from the sun. And I thought, well, my innate reaction was, okay, I'm going to put them together. Um, how do we put them together? Well, we can weave them together. Um, and so I took a lot of these cords, organized them by colors. And um, this is when I started thinking about the kelp forest a little bit more conceptually. Um, visiting the beach inside that kelp rack, you also find some pieces of seaweed that are just completely encrusted in this white thing. And I took it to a scientist and I said, hey, what is this? Um, and so this conversation that I have with scientists really fuels my art practice. And they said, well, I think that's a lace encrusting bryzoan. And I said, I have no idea what the heck that is, but it's attaching onto plastic cups and it's attaching onto seaweed. So I'm very curious, what is this organism? Um, and so I started making these ceramic tiles that were kind of impersonating the style and layout in which these colonies will grow over the seaweed. And instead of putting it over seaweeds, I put it over plastic that I found next to the kelp forests on shore. And I did these pressings. So I took little leaf, leaf size or just little blade, small little blades from the kelp rack and pressed them into the ceramic tile and laid them over with color. Fast forward a few years, I'm still very obsessed with the idea of recycling waste, looking at uh, fishing gear but also representing the kelp forest and having engagement and interaction in, in the kelp forest and the science around it. Um, and so here are two pieces that I wove, Nereocystis and Split Cyst. Um, Nereocystis being the very iconic uh, bull kelp that grows off the coast of Oregon. Um, when I had created this, I'd never seen one uh, living underwater in life. I had just started diving, but I was instantly intrigued by its form and its immense beauty. And as Pat was saying, it's mermaid hair. <laughs> Come to see them in person now. And I will agree, they really do look like mermaid hair. Here's another version of the installation. So I've hung it a couple times and it always looks differently, but that movement in the water column is something I think about constantly when I'm making my pieces. Um, and then next to it is a, a version of a macrocystis with a single, just a single blade well, interpretation of it, and we must say a rough interpretation. Then over, as I said, so I was looking at the kid, the bull kelp, and I was very inspired by its form and by its, um, the science behind it and this crash of the kelp forest off of Mendocino uh, County. And I had never seen it in person. And then uh, this year I moved to Oregon for four and a half months uh, during quarantine. And ta-da, there's bull kelp ev just everywhere. And I got my hands on some of it and I started to untangle it at the beach to smell it. It's always a part of the process is to smell the seaweed, see what it's doing and um, yeah, untangling it and then slowly trying to work with some of these pieces and understand how that, uh, that bull kelp is behaving when it dries, when it's hydrated. So this is a little bit of the science behind the bull kelp. And so I started to roll them. I said, okay, well, what, what kind of thing do I have at home? And I had buckets. So I started to roll them, um, coil them over buckets and let them dry out. Some of them would get moldy, some of them wouldn't, but it was a really interesting process to see how it behaved being taken out of um, its marine environment and then transitioning into a very humid Oregon environment. 
And then that was when I had this idea of bringing people into the art practice and into the process of trying to think of what's our connection to the kelp forest. Um, so very conceptually and, and kind of thinking along these lines of relational aesthetics, like how does this one thing relate to the other thing? How can we all be a part of this marine ecosystem and thinking along these lines? And so I had um, set, up, set up this sign-up sheet for my friends and scientists, researchers, artists, um, anyone with any kind of experience to be a part of this online weaving uh, process. And at this, at this same time that I was creating this online weaving event with pieces of, of actual seaweed, um, both hydrated and dehydrated, um, I started doing researchers with scientists. So this is kind of where Pat and Kyle came in. I said, hey, you guys are doing this inc incredible work in the kelp forest. Um, will you answer some strange questions for me about your relationship with kelp? And um, they were very willing and I, we documented those interviews and I uh, get a lot of feedback. Um, and that kind of, those voices and stories of the kelp forest are what fuel the creative practice for me. And so in this workshop for dyeing, we first, we started to dye natural, other natural materials. So we started to think, okay, kelp, what is it? Well, it's really kind of, it's an algae, but it's made with, um, you know, cellulose and, and what other things on earth can kind of, on, on land could kind of mimic this. And so we started to look at plants and create these dye baths with natural fibers that we would then wrap around the kelp. So kind of this way of wrapping our own culture, something we take from our home, maybe an old shirt, a towel and wrapping it around the kelp, kind of almost like wrapping a present. I, I wouldn't, I, there's a lot of metaphors for it that kind of overlap. Um, and it's also a way to kind of think of the environment around us and our relationship to different plants and animals. And um, with the interviews and, and with everybody together, we had a, an online event weaving together with the kelp. So everybody had their, their kelp coils and had their natural fibers and started to integrate these different elements and think about kelp. And so while we had this performance, we also listened to the, res uh, the interviews with researchers like Pat and Kyle and people got to listen and hear about stories about the kelp forest while they actually touched kelp. I wanted people to touch kelp and to smell kelp. That was the end goal, like let's have this connection to kelp. And through that experience, I had people also comment on what it was like to be with everybody weaving and what it was like to work with, with kelp. And uh, one of the participants says that thinking about the comments of the journey of these fibers or materials to get into our hands. It feels weird even to call them materials. These are other beings in different phases of their existence. So thinking of all these integrated parts and that was Bobby Joe. And then we had Pat, Pat was in the performance as well. So I'll quote, I'm quoting him here. I see you shaking your head. <laughs> so many people. Too, too much of me, too much of me. Okay, now go for it. Um, so many people are thinking about are seeing the kelp forest, but I hope that people can interact with the kelp forest by feeling and experiencing and touching it. I won't read the whole quote out, um, but it was through that that we then kind of came to these end pieces um, where people had put together all the threads and I had documented them um, moving on these like, thin wires and just to kind of think of, of how like the diversity and in, in the ways in which these everybody has essentially got the bull kelp coil and then what they add to it, it was very interesting process um, and very reflective of thinking of the kelp forest. So currently I'm, I've kind of done these different phases and different mediums of working from kelp, either it's representations with uh, old fishing rope that's been recycled on the islands or it's actual kelp pieces collected in Oregon or uh, now I've been thinking about ways of digitally rendering kelp and how we can kind of enter into the space and visualize it. Um, and so then that's where this collaboration enters into. Um, this is very, I think that this is a very rough sketch, but um, uh, Kyle had introduced me to uh, the MetaShape or the Agisoft uh, software to kind of do these renderings. So I did a, a point cloud image of this uh, small seaweed species that I found in the tide pools uh, off of central California. And so you can kind of go in and start to see what it looks like, what the seaweed looks like from all angles. And so I'm thinking of different ways that we can communicate stories about the kelp forest and through different mediums 
um, whether it's photography, film, photogrammetry, or traditional technologies like weaving. And that is what I had to present for you guys today. Thank you so much for listening. I'll exit out now. Okay. Super. Amazing presentations, everyone. You each bring something so unique and interesting. Um, I loved every single, everything that you said. Great images. Uh, okay, if you have any questions, we have a couple up here. Feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, we have one from Brian. Asked, are, I think for Pat, uh, are these two kelps, the bull and the giant, really fighting each other or complementing each other? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, so my, my understanding of the interactions between bull kelp and giant kelp is certainly um, having different organisms in your kelp forest, lots of diversity uh, that, it, you know, that complements each other. It builds on top of uh, each other to have some other um, organisms around you fulfilling similar roles, but each of the giant kelp and bull kelp are in a, they have completely different lifestyles. One is perennial. The giant kelp is kind of, um, as long as that, that hold fast is there and healthy, it can keep being there for a long period of time. So there's actually a few kelp plants that I've, um, started to think of maybe I need to try to like map them out and name them sort of like giant sequoias get named and then take on this own character. There are certain kelp plants out there that I've certainly seen numerous, numerous times, uh, hundreds of times in the same location. So giant kelp kind of persists and then uh, bull kelp is an annual. And so it comes up, gets ripped out, comes back somewhere else, gets ripped out. Um, and so a, a, an old bull kelp might be a couple of years old and generally speaking, they're not lasting a, a super long time. And so the giant kelp is kind of this, this devourer of light, right? It's the second fastest growing photosynthetic organism on the planet after bamboo. It can grow um, several uh, feet in a day in prime conditions. So this thing is just swallowing the light and keeping other organisms from truly competing on its level. And so underneath a giant kelp canopy, like uh, like other uh, presenters um, during these seminars have mentioned, it can be like diving in a night at night. There's just no light. It's super dark. It's really challenging um, uh, to take photos down there because um, the surface is so bright. But down where you're at, it's completely dark. And that's that's not just you know shade. That's the the sun is being consumed. And so you have a lot of other organisms down below that are fine with that. Red algae are eating a different wavelength of light. Um, and you, so you just have this, this, this mechanism there where you have this huge canopy. So then the bull kelp kind of pops up in areas where the giant kelp maybe got ripped out. Um, the bigger a giant kelp plant is, the more friction there is. So the more a surge or wave might tear it out. They get tangled with each other. There's spaghetti kelp that happens, like tor like tortellini kelp just twirled around itself that tear and pull at each other in the kelp, kind of like, you know, a big tree falling into another tree or, you know, dead trees falling and then burning and then causing the, um, the living tree to fall over as well. So there's all those same interactions with the kelp. The bull kelp seems to take advantage of the areas where giant kelp doesn't do well. High surge, high wave energy, um, temporary reef openings, they pop up. So where I've been seeing bull kelp in Monterey is around the giant kelp. And that was especially clear uh, on my last dive at the Carmel Pinnacles, where that young bull kelp was growing, the bull kelp was all deep and around this pinnacle that had the giant kelp. So they are competing with each other, and one seems to come in after the other. And effectively, from what I understand, once giant kelp is established, until something happens, giant kelp is is solidly competing. But uh, I guess it's similar to the NBA super teams. You can only be up there so long, and then an injury happens, and then these other teams are in the finals. Um, for any sports analogy fans out there, I tried on that one. Cool. Awesome. We have a question for Emma on logistics and setting up the weaving event. Uh, Alejandra asked, did you share it across social media or email or something else that looked like meetings were on Zoom? Uh, they're interested in science and art events, so any advice on how to do so would be amazing. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. So the logistics behind it, well, I had a certain number of kelp that I could supply. So I only had 
25 to 30 rounds of the coils that I had tried. Um, I didn't have just complete excess. It just kind of happened through a month's process, just picking up little kelp here and there. Um, and so it, it filled up quite quickly. And of course, it, that's always a question of how do you, do you reach people that you don't know yet before? And so for this first iteration, I decided to keep it internal with some people that I knew that were researching kelp to try to kind of stimulate dialogue of how we can look at kelp differently. Um, but for future art and science events, I don't know if I, this is the place to <laughs> kind of sponsor other art and science events, but uh, there's laser talks uh, around the world that are about art and science and there's opportunities through that. So that's Leonardo laser um, talks and those are fantastic and a good way to get into art and science events and talks. So I highly recommend that. And yeah, maybe next time I'll catch you in another weaving practice. If you share your email, mm -hmm. I'd love to save any emails for interested people. Um, I usually post on Instagram and also send out emails. Great, thank you. Kyle, I've got one for you. Tyler asks, will kelp watch cover all of Alaska or just the southeast? So eventually it will cover all of Alaska right now, but first the southeast. So we have the southeast mostly finished. Um, eventually we're going to extend that out, but I don't have a time frame for when when we'll have the rest of Alaska, Alaska covered. It, it will it will take a while. Every every new region that we do has you know unique challenges, and so you know by the time we process the imagery, do all of our quality control, it, it, it can take a while. But we actually, um, the team got a grant from NASA to extend this globally. So, so you know, after Alaska, we'll extend it down through South America, Chile, um, Sub-Antarctic Islands, New Zealand. Uh, so eventually Kelp Watch will be global, but but we're still um, a little, little ways off from, from that. That'd be amazing when it is. It's such a great tool for everyone. Um, all right, let's see. Doug made a comment that he uses small plastic pieces that we find here on the beach in Oregon and makes little rattles out of bull kelp dried up on the beach. Nice, reduce, reuse, love it. Um, let's see here. Uh, Charles says, decomposing kelp plays um, on the shore. Let's see. Er, let's see. Decomposing kelp um, basically is part of the food chain for invertebrates to invertebrates as it decomposes. Is it anybody you know, science-wise, following that part of the kelp cycle as it decomposes? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Some of my colleagues at the Santa Barbara Coastal Long-Term Ecological Research Project, so the out of UC Santa Barbara, um, are really focusing on, on, on that and, and conducting surveys of the invertebrates that support and then the, um, you know, the, the shorebirds. And so it's a great, that's a great point. The story doesn't end when the kelp gets ripped up from a storm and deposited on a beach or carried, carried offshore. Um, I think that's, yeah. So that's a wonderful point. Um, so yeah, those folks in Santa Barbara are are doing that for giant kelp in in Southern California. Um, that's yeah, that's 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 the, the the group I'm familiar with. Yeah, I wanted to jump in and say too. Um, when I was looking at the kelp rack in Oregon too, there's the kelp will kind of lay on the beach, and when it's decaying, there's a lot of sand fleas that bury underneath it. And it's really exciting to see that and then see the birds come and peck at it. And it's, yeah, it's, it's quite incredible. Yeah, just wanting to add to what both Kyle and Emma were mentioning about, about that, that, that quote um, from, the, from the weaving session about how, you know, these materials are different phases of, of life of the, of the kelp. Um, that was a piece of research that the aquarium wrote a while back with uh, where does the kelp go during the winter because off the back deck of the aquarium in our in the um, aquarium's kelp forest exhibit you can see the flux of the kelp when there's upwelling it's boosting there's tons of kelp in the exhibit when there's uh, winter time conditions even though there's not huge waves the kelp deteriorates and kind of atrophies on exhibit because there's not a lot of nutrition so there's a question about where does the kelp go and so thinking about a kelp forest as one phase of the kelp because during the winter time, 
basically a third will wash up on the beach and become a decomposing uh, crucible for all of these fly larvae and all of these amphipods and other things in the sand, which then is important for all the birds on their migrations to fatten up and keep, keep going. And then another third of that is going to get ripped out and go out into the, um, into the open ocean. And the, there it becomes a kelp paddy where it might be a nursery for young amberjacks, tuna, mola molas, little baby fish are out there in the kelp paddies. And so that becomes a crucial habitat that the kelp is doing. And then the rest of it is going to sink out onto not only the reefs that we have here where the urchins, um, if they have plenty of this drift kelp, then they don't get marauding and go out and try and try to burn down the, the kelp forest Costco because there's plenty of free samples to, to go still. They, they get angry and crawl out if there's not a lot of drift kelp. If there's plenty of drift kelp, they kind of stay there, but it feeds those reefs. But then also some of it will go out into the deep sea. And that's some really trippy stuff sometimes diving on these canyon walls. You see this kelp that's like falling down into the abyss on these sand slopes. And then the kelp ends up feeding this entire deep sea community of invertebrates that might wait for this one manna fall from heaven for the whole year of that kelp being ripped out. So um, yeah, thinking of the kelp forest as just, you know, the large manifestation of all these little planktonic kelps that are out there um, or in the, in the ground and then they're on the beach for Emma to make art uh, or it's on the surface where Kyle can see it from the satellites or it's in the deep sea for all of those uh, critters to, to, to feed on. It's, it's, the kelp is everywhere and interconnected to so many parts of the ocean. Anyway, love kelp. Woo, great. Don't we all? Uh, all right, we have another question. It seems that environments that are more conducive to giant kelp are more conducive to sea otters in comparison to bull kelp areas. Any thoughts on that? I have some thoughts, unless Kyle or Emma wanted to go, but um, so it's hard to. I'd say it's hard to differentiate between where bull kelp is these days and where otters are these days and kind of make a huge correlation because we did a really good job of eliminating otters from Japan to Mexico. And so where they've recovered has uh, a lot to do with happenstance, politics, and then like different, uh, you know, just, just where the otters held on. So we have a central California sea otter that um, is from all of these otters that were left off of Big Sur. And so that's giant kelp. And that's where most of our 3000 sea otters in California are, are from just north of Santa Cruz, um, Pigeon Point, Half Moon Bay area, pretty much all the way down to the Channel Islands. And that's pretty much well within the giant kelp um, area uh, that you saw on Kyle's map. And then north of here is where you have a lot of bull kelp and up further north in Washington, Alaska area, you have otters and bull kelp doing, doing great things. So there's kind of this, um, you know, historical, there should be otters from Mexico all the way uh, up north regardless um, and having them have that, that same type of effect. So um, you definitely see a lot more otters in giant kelp, but I would surmise that that has to do with just like the geography of where they happen to have survived if anyone has any other thoughts on that just for our area. I think that was a great summary. Well, and and so just to add on to that maybe is that otters are gardeners. And so that's something that the aquarium has shown in releasing their otters into uh, Elkhorn Slough, which is a wetland uh, here in Monterey Bay. Um, that's kind of, they were released there not only because it's interesting to see, you know, otters recovering in this habitat that we know they used to be in, in these estuary environments. We think of them as sea otters out there in the open ocean all the time, but they were in estuaries um, at least a little bit. And we also are releasing their, them there because it's easy to follow them and track them from shore to see that they're surviving. So kind of happenstances there with humans and what the otters are doing. And they've recovered the eelgrass beds over there in a similar trophic cascade that happens where the otters are eating crabs that are eating nudibranchs that are eating the algae that are um, covering the eelgrass. So you have this cascading consequence of adding the otters back and then the eelgrass is then a nursery for all these little fishes and you know halibut, um, you name it, are having their time spent in those little eelgrass nurseries. So 
Um, basically, where you put an otter with invertebrates around to eat, it's going to help whatever that invertebrate is suppressing um, out. And so um, bull kelp, giant kelp, eelgrass, it's all good for the, the otters as long as they're snacks. Yes, thanks for talking about the estuaries and sea otters. That might be a potential place for us to release them here in Oregon. All right, I have a question for Kyle from my friend Tristan. Hi, Tristan, thanks for joining. Uh, he said, sorry if you already said this already, um, but are you going to map other parts of the world like South Africa? Yeah, so again, eventually we, we got a grant from NASA to take this to global scales. And so eventually the, 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 the idea is to, is to create global maps of, of canopy form and kelp dynamics and, and again, potentially extend this to other large canopy formers like the Colonia Maxima, um, assuming that the beds are large enough to, to be mapped by Landsat. Um, we're, again, we're starting with, with Landsat. And so that 30 meter resolution um, will be a limiting factor in certain areas, right? In, in, parts, of, in parts of British Columbia, for example, um, you know, the, the beds are small, they're close to shore and, and Landsat's really not capturing all, all the kelp. Um, so, so there will be, with some caveats, understanding that, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to get really small beds close to shore. We will, we will create a global map from Landsat. We're also exploring other higher resolution imagery that can, can allow us to get some of those smaller near shore beds as well. But yes, we will. We're going global. We're going global. So stay tuned. And then awesome. I see a follow up. Um, yeah, can satellites map the moving kelp rafts? That's a it's a great great question. And again, they can if if the rafts are large enough, or if the resolution of the imagery is um, is is fine enough to you know smaller. If the resolution of the imagery is smaller than the size of the raft, absolutely you can you can um, you can you can capture those. And I've seen some you know staring at hundreds or thousands of, of satellite imagery. I've seen rafts. I've seen debris lines. Um, so, so you, you can, you can detect graphs as, as well. Um, and there's, there's other work, other folks are using satellites to map other floating algae like sargassum, you know, in, in um, the South Atlantic and, and, and Gulf of Mexico, there's, there's been work to map, map floating sargassum forests or patties. Maybe we don't call those forests patties. <laughs> Super. All right. Well, it is a little bit over time. Um, do you all have any last minute comments before we end this evening? Just thank you. Thank you again for, for letting us come here and, and talk. And, you know, like Emma said, um, you know, at least for, for myself, most of my work has been focused in California. And so I'm excited as we extend these projects north to Oregon, to Washington, to Alaska, and eventually to South Africa and Chile. Um, you know, really looking forward to learning from from the folks that um, have, have worked in worked in these areas for long periods of time. Um, oh. Sorry, <laughs> I'm just going to kind of add to that. Thank you so much, Chanel, for having us here today and uh, it's always a pleasure to be in conversation um, with, with all of you guys. <laughs> so thank you for that. Yeah, I just want to say thank you, Kyle, for uh, the super cool website that I'm definitely going to be spending a lot of time zooming in on. Um, feels like uh, a more uh, catered to me Google Maps experience. So I appreciate <laughs> going to start planning some photo trips with that. Um, and uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you to Emma who um, got me involved in uh, in the, that cool weaving project, and then led me led me over here. So thanks, Emma, for for uh, roping me into this, and thank you to uh, Chanel and the Alaka Alliance for uh, doing some really interesting work uh, and cons and having conversations about where conservation can go and the return of sea otters and kelps in a different permutation than we've experienced for the last several hundred years uh, along the coast. Um, and I want to thank everybody who uh, who tuned in, all of my friends that I paid a lot of money to come and watch. No, uh, thank you for everybody just showing up and enjoying the, the, the discussion on kelp. Loved it. Thanks for having me.
Of course. Thanks everyone for joining and sticking around. And I'll um, send out an email to uh, everyone who registered with all our panelists links that they shared. Um, so you can get in contact with them and learn some more about everything that they talked about. So have a great evening and stay tuned for more wonderful webinars with the Lock Alliance. Goodbye. <laughs>